Bueno, voy a dar la ponencia en inglés, pero muchas gracias por la introducción. Um, so, hello everyone. Kai um, Shogo um, I Today I'm talking about ancient history, classical reception and counterfactuals present in the recent video game uh, Expeditions Room. So, first of all, uh, video games are interactive media and that means that historical video games, by extension, provide uh, players the allowances to rewrite history through the, through the gameplay. Um, this is something that Chapman has called a counterfactual historian. Um, however, previous analyses on this phenomenon have focused more on the historian part rather than uh, simpler counterfactuals, such as um, the question, what if Caesar hadn't crossed the Rubicon? Well, Expeditions Rome is a game that asks the question, what if Caesar hadn't crossed the Rubicon? Um, it presents the player a counterfactual history of the late Republic, um, which is uh, the which is uh, developed based on the player's actions in game and uh, makes the player a sort of uh, counterpart to a historical Caesar. Um, it is an interesting subject for analyzing both counterfactuals and classical receptions in popular culture. So the game is divided into four acts. The first one is Asia Minor. Uh, the player fights Mithridates in the uh, third Mithridatic War, um, sort of. The second one uh, deals with Africa, with Cleopatra and the Nasamonas. Uh, the third one is Ver Vercingetorix, uh, the conquest of Gaul by Caesar, basically. And the fourth one uh, starts with a question whether the player will, will cross the Rubicon with his army or not, uh, in a parallel to Caesar. Uh, there are intermissions in Rome between acts and the backdrop of Roman politics, as well as uh, everything being contained in a, in a narrative of player conflict against a power-hungry politician named Vitellius Luico. Um, so first of all, the game is framed as, as a historian's narrative. Um, it has a very heavy pro-Roman bias intended and could be lampooning to not authors such as Diodorus or Livy, perhaps, but uh, this, this bias goes unexamined and unremarked. Um, all acts actually start with Rome, justified in military action. So the intranarration uh, talks about Rome fighting, quote, several wars of self-defense. Uh, there is no mention of how Rome acquired Asia Minor as well. Um, and when it comes to imperialism, the game uh, talks about the, the bad parts of imperialism as only coming from bad apples from within uh, the player's legion. Um, so the assassination of Lucullus uh, by Lurko in the second act uh, provides a motive to interfering in Africa. Uh, Lurko supports Ptolemy in the historical uh, civil war and therefore must be defeated along with Ptolemy. Um, at the end, there's a choice whether to kill or spare Cleopatra or the leader of Nasamones. Um, either way, uh, Rome either is forced to control the Nasamones or is forced to control Egypt. Um, in one ending, if Rome collapses, Egypt goes back to, quote, a sovereign and tyrannical nation. Uh, the third act uh, is framed, uh, starts with a Gallic attack on Rome, which could be a parallel with the Catalinarian conspiracy, but this could be very accidental rather than intentional. Uh, Gallic characters point out the unjustified nature of the invasion, but the player has no choice but to conquer Gaul uh, because he's working on behalf of the dictator Lurko. Uh, there's a slave, act, uh, there's also a slave gla gladiator revolt in Thrace in Act One, which is actually instigated by the player, but is, it is always suppressed either early on or later on with much bloodshed. And if it's not suppressed, suppressed early on, then the narration speaks of escaped slaves terrorizing Roman citizens. Uh, it's a clear parallel with the third ser servile war, but there is no mention of the first or the second one. Um, talking about uh, leading men and culture, so the ending the narration of the Nasamonas and Gauls uh, implies that sovereignty is only possible via a singular ruler. For the Nasamonas, if the leader is dead, the tribes are full of uh, fight, uh, fight with each other. Rome, quote, has to intervene, and then their traditions and cultures are lost. If the, little le uh, if, if the leader lives, 
the region is peaceful and the leader is respected and long lived. For Gaul, uh, if Vercingetorix is dead, the uh, uh, chieftains are infighting and the culture is again lost. But if, and also the narration speaks of how Gaul's quote, must be grateful civilization was brought to their lands. Uh, if Vercingetorix is kept alive, then uh, he kept the peace among the tribes and the culture uh, is maintained despite the subjugation by Rome. If the player becomes a princeps, uh, narration claims that the Romans' lives are universally improved, even though if Pompey is also left alive, uh, there is a civil war that happens, so it's hard to reconcile that. Uh, the game's history is very muddied and it's very hard to find comparison points. If the player doesn't march in Rome, uh, Cato, a defender of patricians, becomes a shield against populism. Uh, and if the player is executed for causing a civil war, then uh, discontented mobs demand change, which leads to Rome falling. Rome uh, is claimed by many characters to be riddled with bickering. There's uh, especially criticism of the patri patrician class and the class conflict between optimates and popularis. But the game implies that everything is fixed after a single man is defeated, namely Lyrico, which is a complete contrast to actual history of the late Republic. Um, so was the system actually bad? Well, the game's answer is that we just needed the right person to fix the issues, either by moral example or by political will. The player is always the savior of Rome, except for the one ending, but notably for the civil war plus execution ending. Um, historically, the Senate led three Caesar's assassins and Cicero even allied with them to overthrow Antony. So the execution here is probably uh, would not happen. Um, so for the characters in, this, in these acts and the, the players in these acts, um, so in the game, uh, characters have various character traits, such as honest, stoic, classist, generous, or sexist, and they provide responses and reactions to, play act, to the player's own actions and dialogue, um, which allows the game then provides some sort of interaction for the player with putative ancient views. Um, some historical characters, however, have had important changes. So for instance, Lucullus, has none of the extravag extravagant behavior post Mithridates that he's known to have had. Um, he is also assassinated rather than die peacefully in act two of the game. Um, Cicero first also condemns an execution without trial in act four, even though this uh, presumably takes place post the Catalinarian conspiracy where he famously executed senators without trial. Um, he also condemns the player for killing Lurko to rescue his followers from the execution, even though he historically showed vast and continuous approval of Caesar's assassination, and even sometimes begrudged Antony not also having been assassinated as well. Um, he remains in the Senate when the player is emperor, and however, only as a dis dissenter, bringing about a quote, more just empire versus historically having machinated to overthrow Antony constantly. Uh, Cato himself, uh, <laughs> accordingly, does not, according to the game, does not join attempt to overthrow the player emperor, even though his historical death in Utica speaks otherwise. Uh, if you allow a joke, he was besides himself dying with, uh, from fighting against Caesar. Even when the woman player avatar marries Cato, there's no mention of the Marcia affair either. Cleopatra is romantable if the player is a male avatar, sexualized portrait, and has a vast amount of orientalist trope, tropes. Uh, she's haughty, arrogant, narcissistic, and a seductress. Ptolemy himself also has Egyptian regalia and is portrayed as a colonialist force versus Cleopatra's nativizing force. Vitellius Lurko is the game portrayals of an arch enemy. He is corrupt, power hungry, anti-establishment. Uh, he is an autocratic revolutionary. He is populist and underhanded. Uh, and he is also evil and also uniquely evil. But this does not have any realistic parallels with historical persons such as uh, Octavian or, or Caesar. Uh, the game consistently allows both callousness and gracefulness to enslave people, such as the gladiator revolt. Half of the player's followers are enslaved people or were enslaved at one point. Uh, the player can help them kill slavers, but the player also enslaves people after battles. 
Um, they, however, cannot be sell, set free, only sold, and upgraded resources require enslaved people uh, to acquire. Um, there's a reduction in the number of slaves after acquiring uh, a resource, so perhaps this implies that. Uh, also, the protagonist has a personal service until the end. It is, he is not manumitted and he is not allowed to be manumitted until the end of the game. So, the game bends history for less morally, politically and philosophically amb uh, ambiguous choices for the player. It's a power fantasy. The game's angle is mostly pro-reformist, non-revolutionary, except when it comes to benevolent autocracy. Um, the intricacies of historical characters are subsumed into simple archetypes. For instance, Cato's profoundly misguided posturing and traditionalism actually swayed Rome to civil war rather than save the Republic. The intricacies of international relations are also subsumed into morally acceptable gameplay. Um, so, for instance, the Caesar's pretext for the Gallic extermination are not so clear cut in history as they are in the game. Though not wholly unexamined, there is not much critical commentary on an, an ancient prejudices. Slavery is, is given a very strange treatment, both condemnable by the player, but also enforced and accepted as an institution. There's plenty of Orientalism in the, in the portrayal of Africa. There's a lot of Roman supremacist ideas, such as, uh, as well as bringing civilization in order. Um, the counterfactuals in the game are marred by just very messy history. They, the, the scenarios are, are idealized and whitewashed, and the complexity of the late Republic politics are turned into a good versus evil fight, providing clear philosophically neat choices to the player. Uh, it's a lost opportunity to explore the actual history of the late Republic, how the tradition and protocol were strangling much needed reform. The game has, however, many aspects analyzable more in depth, such as the portrayal of slavery, orientalism, or even philosophy. There's dozens of or hundreds of hours of content that one could, not, could analyze, such as dialogue, ludonarratives, game mechanics. Um, and even though this is not the first analysis, uh, analysis of the game, uh, it has a different angle to the previous ones. And uh, in conclusion, I think this is a good state uh, case study for understanding, uh, for analyzing classical reception in modern media. Thank you very much.